Okay. Hi, everyone. I guess you can see and hear me properly. Uh, as I understand that this is the final uh, working day of the semester and for the graduating batch, this probably would be the last so-called class. So uh, I don't know if whether to say that this is fortunate or unfortunate, but I guess it is what it is. So uh, what I will do basically in this class is to give an overview of what we have done thus far and try to kind of touch on some of the topics that I had said that I would. I don't know how much of a justice I would be able to do to all of those because it would have been better if we could have had a proper class class, if you know what I mean. But uh, we then have to get moving with what we have. The main purpose of having a discussion session like this, of course, usually it would have been a two hour long class, but as it's just a recording of me speaking into the void, it won't be a two hour long class, it will be much shorter. And it's 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 meant mostly for you to think about stuff. Uh, the, that, that would be the major hope that it would spur some new thoughts within you and so that you would take them forward in some shape or form and that would help you with your future projects or or anything for that matter. That that would just help you think in, in, in perhaps a different way that that would be a success altogether. So that is something that is very important uh, to note here. The first that I, I, I will start off a little bit with what we have done thus far. Uh, I will just whip up a small little document that I have had uh, that I have been kind of jotting down the points that uh, I have covered thus far and the points that I have planned to cover. Uh, so for that, I thank Lavanya for diligently taking down notes in class and sharing them with me. I was traveling for a few days. That's why I, I wanted to schedule a class, but it was not possible. So yeah, just give me one moment. So I guess this is visible now. Just one moment. Yep. I guess it's up now. So here, the first things first is what we have done and what we can do or what is to do. Uh, so we did talk a little bit about the design and the structure and the possibilities of gaming when we just started speaking about gaming. That how, you know, the objectives and the kind of progress mechanism is very important for games. And of course, these terms that I have laid out in this document is not done out in a linear manner and uh, don't consider it to be linear either because ludology would, of course, be one of the foundational things that we had discussed in class, the very first class, actually. So uh, in, in the discussions regarding ludology, we talked about how uh, the element of choice, the how the element of traversal comes into play when we talk about nonlinear forms of media and how it is, how is it different from other forms of media. So it is important that you think about these things, not just in terms of games, but also in terms of other stuff that you encounter. It can be a web page, it can be uh, it can be a piece of electronic literature, it can be a game, it can be it can be anything. It can be you opening up a uh, Amazon shopping website and searching for, I don't know, whatever you want to buy. So there are various types of, there are various modes of interacting with media. And that is something that is very important to highlight. And, and what are the mechanisms of how you understand that form of media, right? Uh, because that's what I was talking to you in, 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 in the first class is that uh, when we think of representation or depiction in any shape or form it comes to us via this print notion the very literary studies dominated notion of the formal analysis or just looking at the representation depiction and characters that's just it just give me one moment someone is knocking at my door
Yeah, hi. Sorry for that interruption. Uh, someone was asking for my cycle. <laughs> okay, so that is these in modes of reading something that is that is a bit different from what we are accustomed to read or understand or traverse, as our set says, right? That is something that is very important. I am going on a bit of a revisionist thing. Not revisionist, oh my god. I am going on a bit of a revision uh, because it will help you uh, figure out all what we have done and kind of uh, get them into your clutches of understanding. So that's about ludology. And we talked about how ludology always operates in contestation with narratology and how the element of narratology comes from the aspect of narrative and how there is a debate in the field of uh, video game studies uh, and the conflict between uh, ludology and narratology, that whether the interactive element or whether the progressive element or traversive element of games is more important or the storytelling element of games more important. I leave that up to you. I, of course, discuss ludology in more details than narratology because I feel that the ludic element of games, of course, is more important than the narrative element of games because if you, if you, if you take away the ludic element from the games, then, of course, we have films and other forms of media which engages in the narrative mode. Of course, but the speciality of the medium of the video games is not just in the narrative, but uh, it presupposes the narrative, right? In certain cases, not in every case, not all games have narrative, right? And uh, and and then it builds on, basically, it builds on uh, to understand how the narrative progresses, not just progresses, how the narrative imbibes that kind of traversive mechanics, okay? That is important to note. And then we come to the element of the cyber cafe space and access, okay? That video games as, let's say, a cultural artifact is not something that is accessible to everyone, even at this point, or it even was not when it first started being popular, especially in the context of India. Today, I will talk a little bit more about that when I talk about the history, uh, the so-called history of video games or the so-called history of computation uh, in India, of course, I will go on a bit of a, a discussion, not a lot. Uh, I talked about uh, access in terms of cyber cafes and how cyber cafes opened up this democratic space for discussions and not not discussions uh, of of playing games and, and how it it gave rise to uh, gaming cultures. And uh, more often than not, I was mentioning about how. It is extremely male dominated in most cases. And I mentioned also about Poonam Chaudhary and Zahra Rizvi's work in this regard, which I believe is very important as the keynote uh, for Digra conference. That if you would like, please let me know. I will share the link with you. No problem. Uh, so that is a very important thing to note. And here we come to the element of gender in gaming. And as you may understand, that the intersectional questions, be it of gender, class, caste, race, uh, ableism, these issues proliferate in every field of our understanding and existence. So it is no different for game studies as well. And it is very important that we look into these aspects and these representations in the gaming space as well, right? So. That is something uh, that has to be taken into account. Of course, it has to be taken into account. And, and then we also talked about the issues of microtransactions in gaming and how gaming has also been uh, been plagued with this issue of, uh, of uh, microtransactions and how many game developers are now motivated not by getting a good game out there, which tells a good story, has a good gameplay, but it's also how much money you can make from the game. You know, how much money can you make the player spend, not just while buying the game, but during the act of playing the game until and unless it's completely exhausted. So, uh, because these microtransactions have taken up such an important role within the, the discourse of gaming, it has almost gone on to the point where it's now influencing gambling laws and, and, and online transaction laws. So much so that there have been countries like, I believe, the Netherlands, who have now have had like uh, gaming uh, laws related to gambling, which affect also gaming because microtransactions, even though especially executives and representatives from studios like EA Studios, uh, they, uh, you know, uh, they have sent legal representatives in court to uh, 
let's say, ask and defend how microtransactional policies do not adhere to that of gambling practices, but it's very difficult to make a case for that. It's, it's extremely difficult to make a case for that because, uh, because that that's how you kind of go back to the idea of multi-level marketing or a Ponzi scheme or, or let's say, a, a, trying, a pyramid scheme. And, and you say that, okay, this is not that, but uh, microtransactions in gaming is a huge problem at the moment. And I did talk about it. I, I did give you examples of how uh, under-supervised young people, uh, teenagers, uh, kids, uh, under-supervised by their parents can lead them to spend lots and lots of money uh, and, and actually drain their parents' wallets. So that is something... That is something to note that, that that when we talk about the finances and economics of gaming, it is not just about whether the uh, thing that you are buying, whether the game that you are buying, whether, whether, whether the hardware that you are buying is expensive or not. That is a very important factor and I will come to that. But it is also important to note that when you are playing the game, then also there are these... Uh, mechanisms which are put into practice that will constantly try to drain the last penny from you. Uh, so so uh, now uh, some developers are getting so greedy that in every step of, of a game, like the, the, there are like pay to win possibilities. Literally, this is what we call pay to win. Uh, apparently it is it is competitive, it is uh, it is open, it's it's transparent, but uh, if you if you just look underneath and, and, and give, give it a critical eye. It's, it's, it's nothing but plain and simple pay to win policies. So uh, these consciousness, the, the having having the consciousness of how uh, the act of play and, and finance and gambling come, can come together and how it can be extremely harmful if not regulated properly for the society at large is I believe something that should be researched a little bit more. Uh, and I believe that now it is being done so, economics, uh, the economic factor of gaming, I wouldn't say economics, of course I don't have that kind of an expertise. Uh, now coming about the now the hardware, you know, the, 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 the for example, recently um, I had my birthday, I went home and I got some money and, and therefore I decided to upgrade my, my, my laptop, which is pretty old now, which, which I got in 2019, it's 2023. It's a four-year-old laptop, which as you may understand is as good as a big piece of brick. And therefore I decided to upgrade my laptop. What did I, what, what did I do then? I swapped my hard disk for something that is called a solid state drive. Hard from an HDD, a hard disk drive to a solid state drive. And I had an 8 GB of RAM and I changed it for a 12 GB of RAM. So just to do these two things, it cost me 10,000 rupees. So, uh, and I'm not even talking about the graphics card. The graphics card in itself costs around 10 to 15 K at least, 10 to 15,000 rupees at least. So these factors, you know, hardware capabilities that is your system capable enough to run a particular game? Is your system up to the mark to uh, handle particular games at particular graphic levels? Because if a game is not running at a particular uh, efficiency, then it will be too laggy, the graphics will not be up to the mark, and the experience of playing that game will never ever be as good. So uh, these aspects, because I remember, remember when, when I was growing up as, as a child, I, I did not have a graphic card enabled PC in my place. Yes, I was privileged enough to have a personal computer in my place, but I did not have a graphic card. Therefore, whenever I wanted to play games, I used to ask to my friends that, do you have this game? Does it run without a graphics card? Does this run without a graphics card? Does that run without a graphics card? So all the conversations that used to happen regarding gaming for people like me used to have the pretext of not having a graphics card. And I remember doing these Google searches, can this game run without a graphics card? Can that game run without a graphics card? So as time has gone on, as you know, I have made some money for myself and I have been able to invest in something where I can get a graphics card and I can play. But still, there are many, many, many games that require like the top level, top end hardware systems, which is not affordable for, for everyone. Uh, so that is something that, that is to be noted. That is that we used to figure out strategies on how to play the games just by overcoming these hurdles. And, and it's not just this. Then there was also the severe stigma that uh, that you know our elders used to have that uh, gaming means viruses that that playing games means that you are infecting your computer with viruses this week 
course, that's a joke. Uh, so, uh, and also because uh, uh, games were downloaded from sh shady sources and people didn't know how to download them properly and that there were pirate uh, uh, make, uh, stuff, pirating involved. I'm sure you have discussed in detail about pirate modernity and so on. So, uh, uh, the element of gaming and viruses and how it would affect your system is, is something that is uh, inherently connected. That is something that you cannot separate one from the other. So uh, we, when we, we used to engage in gaming cultures, these were the two issues that, that used, used, we had to navigate all the time because we knew if something would go wrong, our parents would kill us. So uh, when the, uh, that, that's what I was saying in my class as well. When you look at a culture, when you look at a gaming culture, you cannot just look at how the games are being played and how, you know, how the character looks. Yes, the character uh, appearances of characters can be problematic. We did Nakamura. We talked about gaming characters. We talked about the problematics of representation, right? I showed you Far Cry 3. I showed you Battlefield, this, that, this, that. So, yes, of course, character design, character depiction, they are all problematic. And I understand that completely. But you have to also understand that it's not just about the game. When we talk about gaming cultures, it's not just about the game. It is the act of playing the game within a social system that involves you, who may or may not be a player, that involves me, I am a player myself. It involves the game and it involves the entire ecosystem and it involves the practices inside that ecosystem and you will see that these kind of how what can i call it these uh, simplistic assumptions is not just present in game studies where people would be like okay i will just critically analyze the story in a video game with you know metaphor irony this that or the literary studies ideas and okay that would be a game studies work no it's not it's very similar to the problematic methodology that is used by many English graduates, especially in film studies as well, that they would read a piece of text, a piece of film text, and they would say that how it is adapted from another text and they would compare the adaptations or they would look at a film in, in some post-trauma feminist lens, this, that, and they would just analyze the film text. That's it. That's all they, they would do. That falls under the domain of film form and analysis, which just talks about the film text, the film itself, what is happening inside the film, the frames, the sequences, the scenes, how the actors are acting, how they're moving their bodies, etc., etc., etc. That's one very small overdone part of film studies. But if you look at film studies, cinema studies as a discipline per se, as a culture, then it's not just about the film. It's about how the audience is reacting to the film. It's about the, let's say, the labor laws present in the film industry. Let's say about the gender gap in the film industry. So when we talk about film cultures, gaming cultures, we talk about the practice of that entire thing by placing it within a social context. It's very important. And the same applies for gaming as well. And I made that point home very clearly when I was taking the class as well. That gaming is not just about playing the game. No, it is the most important prerequisite. Many people talk about game studies or games without having played a single game in their life. And you would also be able to understand when they're doing that. Because they are just engaging in the summary of the game. And not in the ludic elements of the game. Right? But the act of gaming. Right? That involves not just you playing the game, but that involves the entire society in question. So there is a, can I afford to buy a piece of hardware? Can I afford to buy this game? Is this game problematic? Why? What are the problematic aspects of this game? How does this game depict history? Or how does this game, does this game have political connotations? Do the financial microtransactions, how does it influence gambling? Is it corrupting the kids? Is this game violent? Does games mean violence? Is that a problematic notion? Yes, it is. Because I talked about AAA gaming, right? And AA gaming and how AAA gaming is like the masala films and other games are not so. So that is what. When you look at cultural practices, you have to look at the entirety of the picture and not just one slice of it. And that is how you refine your own research question, right?
that is what the the aim of a course like new media studies is not meant to give you everything about everything because there are so many different forms of media do you get to know everything about everything of course not it's meant to give you a contextualization about certain practices in different forms of media and politics in different forms of media or medias i don't know if that plural makes sense but yes it is what it is right that let's say when we had the telephone and now we have the mobile phone but earlier we had different devices or different pieces of technology for different stuff now the mobile phone can do a lot so you can say that it has converged into something so now you're looking at different types of media practices and when you talk about gaming when you talk about film when you talk about writing when you talk about the digital part of writing the analog part of writing the pre analog part of writing manuscript writing oral traditions and so on then you talk about different strategies of communication as well so by showing different facets and i am dealing with one facet video games is to look at these different parts within the society and to see how people within this subculture of gaming you know how do they operate behave practice and how do people outside that how do they operate behave and practice right this is something that is very important once again i'm reiterating that practice within a culture is extremely extremely important now moving on is to the question of of course i i talked about gendered spaces and and critical technocultural discourse analysis i went through critical technocultural discourse analysis in a lot of depth in the last class where i showed my own paper on hitman and i uh, explained how i am using critical technocultural discourse analysis any one of you who's interested in reading the paper can of course get in touch with me i'll share the paper with you right away no problem uh and any one of you who's interested in doing some kind of social media analysis looking at practices in digital spaces uh critical technocultural discourse analysis is a very very important tool to have and the more important reason why this paper is is important to me per se because i am using a method which was technically not used for games so i borrowed that method and use it for games but that is to also tell you that it's not necessary that your methodology always have to be from a field where you're working you can also decontextualize another methodology in another case and use it for your context but of course that heavy lifting of shifting the methodology from one context to the other has also got to be justified in, in every single case so that is also something that is extremely extremely important to to note and now as i have given you a very rough cut summary of what all we have been able to do thus far i will move on with very few elements that i want to introduce to you today uh, i promise that i won't introduce a lot of new things because of course today is the last day of class and i believe this is 8 uh, minutes past 5 in the evening and my graduating friends will be having their farewell from 6 which is exactly 52 minutes from now so i promise to keep it short and not blabber on a lot you have heard a lot of that already Uh, so just give me one moment while i have a sip of water yeah okay so first things first i will talk about a little bit about the history of video games in india or the so called non history of video games in india and i will be referring to a few incidents that happened in the country which can possibly be the reason as to why video game cultures are not as prominent in india as it is in many of the western countries and for this i will be using the book called video games in the indian subcontinent uh, by shovik mukherjee uh, i have spoken about shovik sir's work 
many times in my previous classes as well and i'm going to do the same here too uh, this book came out a few months ago and i am fascinated by the methodology that dr mukherjee has used and i have also written about it uh, as a as a review piece which is uh, supposedly coming out from press start in glasgow in, in in a year i don't know i'm supposed to revise the paper as of yet <laughs> so i will look into that book and a few instances uh, and i will show you how and why computational technologies and advent of computational technologies in india play such an important role in the growth slash non growth of these practices in india so let's get started i have the book opened with me just give me for one minute or two to go to the important pages so that i can share it with you right away So if you can see my slides, my not my slides, but if you can see my screen here, I think you can. You'll see that this is the book, right? Video Games in the Indian Subcontinent. If you if you want access to the book, please let me know. I'd be more than happy to do that. More than happy to share it with you. So here, see the appendix one, this is the timeline, timeline of video game related events in India. So as you may see that all of these events are not directly connected to video games in india but how they are connected you know so you can see the first you're talking about the holodix machines right now holodix machines were brought into india in 1931 to perform the calculations for the defense department and later on post independence uh, you see the first computer in india was installed the HEC 2M is installed at the Indian Statistical Institution in Kolkata, right? So, and then you see the TIFRAC, which is the TIFR automatic calculator, the full scale version of TIFR's pilot machine, which was formally commissioned in February 1960 and was named in 1962. So, now then ISIJU was built in. Indian Statistical Institute in collaboration with Jalapur University. It was called ISIJU-1. It just came out in 1966. So, as you see, in these times, 55, 59, 66, India was just starting to enter into the domain of computing. And at that point of time, the other countries have already made their computers established systems and getting ahead with it. And at that point of time, especially post-independence, people like Nehru, PC Mohalanobish, later on Homi Bhava, these people were literally trying to, especially Mohalanobish, they were trying to get computers in the country, very importantly speaking. Because it was at that point, it was mostly needed for the planning commission. I hope you know what the planning commission is. If not, just do a quick Google search, you'll understand it, no questions. So, because India understood that as a country, in order to move ahead with the planning of the planning commission, and in order to carry out that amount of statistical number crunching, their systems were not enough and they needed these automatic systems. And that was the birth 
other than the holodeck machines which were brought for defense purposes of course that was the kind of birth of uh, how computers were brought in into the country right now if you see in 1973 right now this is not a company type event this is not an it development event in 1973 you see that this guy called satish bhutani joins this company called atari now if you know atari is a very famous game company yeah he is of indian and french descent and he dropped and is out of college and he joined atari to be the export administrator to both europe and soon to be important market of japan because japan has a very vibrant gaming culture of its own now he is of indian descent does it affect india in any shape or form probably not is it because of india's stringent labor laws um, sorry stringent market policy at that point of time as you all know the liberalization of the economy happened in the 90s before that import and export was very expensive not just expensive it was virtually not possible okay so the element of speculation is what comes into the picture here that if we don't have something or if we did not have something now is the point to question ask that why is it the case go back in history look if there is absence of material data engage in speculation to understand that why can certain cultures not be there this method of understanding absence of historical data is called the mode of speculative history where if you do not have material history you engage in speculation as to understand and ponder why is something not there okay now here you see that in 1979 captain gurmeet singh writes a tank warfare simulation game for his mtech thesis in the year 1979 for a dc 1090 system so there are these one or two sp sprouts of activity somewhere but it is not gaining steam why because there is no institutional support towards it in the shape of import and export laws because you can't expect a government of a newly independent country to come out and say okay everyone please start playing games not but in the broader context in order for the machines to arrive at least from the foreign market there has to be a flexible system that allows that to happen right but more often than not it didn't happen at that point of time because of the laws mostly so in the 1980s the backyard innovation of the 1980s in a shift in the production market in order to face a closed economy the lachpat rai market in the 1980s was part of the backyard innovation while importers bought video games in the market the quantities and the prices were not suitable to meet the demand of video games in local markets as well as that of outside of delhi so as you may see that the, yes the cultures are growing up the portable game systems and and the how home game systems are coming up but they can't meet the prices so many traders started making clones of them you know making cheap knock offs of them in order to sell them in the market because who doesn't love games right but even then they were expensive so as to so that it would percolate in the mainstream market uh, everyone could afford the samurai gaming consoles was one such clone the traders carefully assembled chips of nine ic boards in their shops and they imported the chips and cartridges from china and the assembly was done in a local market and that's how it happened so the jugaad is very important here that what then nintendo actually licenses its consoles to samurai but then it even it fails because that amount because the pricing is still not there and then it fails the samurai licensing does not work right then in 1991 you see mitashi starts business as a video game console maker right as a video game con a video game console company mitashi it plunged into a 480 crore industry with its presence in tvs and acs etc etc but even mitashi's market 
fell drastically with the shift from console based gaming to mobile based gaming right and then we have of course the introduction of internet in india and in 1995 we have sega consoles who emerged this into the market to rival nintendo products once again it failed because high prices but now you have to remember that it's in the 90s we have entered the era of economic neoliberalization even then it's too expensive in 1996 the so called first cyber cafe was opened in india now, they do not exist right now but we can speculate that did they have games probably not 1997 the first game company game developer this first game developer in company it was founded by rajesh rao but as you see that there have been yes the snake game comes in the, one of the most important events in indian gaming history is how snake is kind of imprinted in the indian memory right so there have been as you see there have been gaming utv india games have been founded yodha the warrior game has been there uh, playstation 2 was formally launched in india and uh, there was a star sport super selector game that was created by joy bhattacharya who is still very active in in many sporting circles especially cricket and there have been other games like bhagat singh the game there have been a game magazine but as you see that these uh initiatives were not really gaining that much of a steam there have been there and stop there and stop uh, uh, something is opening up and it's closing down something is opening up and it's closing down why is it happening is it happening because there is a lack of awareness there is a lack of motivation yes of course it's a lack of concerted development they, they simply did not see the market the developers did not see the market of a gaming culture in india and this is the 2005 the first impulse thesis on video games and storytelling was published this is of course the, the thesis of shobhik mukherji himself he is being humble that way he is mentioned his own name so the 2000 nascom gaming forum was established here and they used to have meetings so now you see that in the 2000s slowly slowly there are centralized approaches towards making some kind of gatherings happen in gaming but does it create now the question is okay fine by 2006 of course gaming with mobile gaming and all that stuff i remember in class in 2006 i was in class 1 or 2 and i remember games being very uh, being very excited by games yeah, i want to play games and this that with my personal computer but even then it was so expensive that not many people had access to these because they need either you need a super fast internet to download these games or you need access to those cd parlors where you can get those games and actually play them so it was slowly slowly happening but it was yet to reach that space which i believe was actually achieved uh, by the democratized so called democratization of the internet and, uh, and and the pubg revolution of course the ubisoft open city india version in 2008 and in 2008 we have the gajini version of the game and, and as you see that there are a lot of film tie-ins bhagat singh game gajini game as you see tying in with recognized ips was thought of an interesting uh, investment but actually didn't turn out to be so which is true not just for the gaming market in india by the way it's true for the gaming market universally because previously what used to happen is that let's say spiderman 2 came out and then spiderman 2 the game comes out with toby maguire as spider man in the game itself the game tie-ins were uh, uh, game tie-ins to films okay but they've tanked horribly most of these those games used to be horrible uh, there are a few exceptions of course spider man to be one of okay so that is something that that you need to know and shobhik mukherjee's research here is also very very important it's, it's because his work is the, the definite still happens to be a definitive work In 2014, studio Olio Mingus, an independent art studio, comes up in India with Dhruv Jani as the founder, and then Teen Patti Games comes up based in Bangalore. Of course, Teen Patti Games has its own uh, 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 kind of, uh, let's say, problematics in terms of financing and politics, uh, gambling. So I, I request you to kind of look into it. So. As you can see, that Steam starts pricing in Indian rupees. In two thousand fifteen, 
it feels like I have been using Steam since so long. But it started in 2015 is that when Steam finally started pricing in Indian rupees. Before that, even Steam, which is a very popular platform to buy games, important. They did not even have their Indian pricing before 2015. And that is when Indian Gaming Expo happened for the first time. So as, as, as you can see, slowly we are reaching to the, because in the 2000s, it was there, but it was a very top-down level of elite hierarchy where not everyone could afford it. It's only with the 2010s and in the mid-2010s, just before the geo internet boom, we see that there are efforts where they are slowly percolating into the masses, where more and more people are playing games. And that's exactly how we remember that when we were in class 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, we were so much into gaming. A lot of our friends were downloading games, playing games, etc, etc, etc. Because at that point of time, we had reached a certain space where there were not only high-end high graphic games, but there were also low-end low graphic games that other people and it was not just the high graphics ones. But those low-end games 10 years ago were the high-end games. And there were no low-end games to play in PCs. So that's how the progression works kind of. In 2016, we have a very important game called Darshan Diversion, created by Padmini Re Mari, which also, of course, talks about the Sabri Mala incident. 2016, Rockstar opened its studios in India. Now, Rockstar is one of the biggest gaming studios. You may have played uh, uh, GTA, uh, and you know that. So, in 2016, you see, it coincides with the launch of Geo, by the way. Establishment of All India Gaming Federation. It's an online gaming industry. Apex body based on, of skill-based online gaming industry. So, there have been games like Asura and Raji, of course. And in 2007, of course, the Blue Whale uh controversy which is which was dubbed as a game but then of course it challenges one to think that what is of course the idea of a game so as to speak suicide game where the player is given certain tasks to complete over a period of 50 days and the final task is to kill yourself so directed internet provider to immediately remove the links of this dangerous online game so it's the blue whale ban and, and the whole controversy i remember it vividly i was in the second year of my college and how people were connecting it to games, which was basically a suicide mission, was very fascinating and, and very scary. And, and, and of course, a trigger warning is, of course, a belated trigger warning is due. And as you can see that here, we're talking about many other from small games that have come out. Yeah, in 2019, we have had the first major conference in gaming. It happened in presidency. I applied for it, but my abstract got rejected. <laughs> And finally, there have been this game called Raj, Raji. Raji is a very nice game and you can talk about it. You can play it. It's very beautiful. 2021, uh, we have this game called Foji, which of course has its political ideas associated with it. Or however you look at it. It was a tribute to the Indian Armed Forces and it was a game that was heavily memed, of course. The Battlegrounds Mobile India, PUBG launches it in order to just play, make it playable in India because PUBG was banned. So this is, this is the Indian part of the story about video games in India. So as you may see that most of the, we start off with why it's not there. And then we say, okay, it's there, but it's there only to a certain degree. But now, yes, it's there. It's everyone is playing it. But it's still, what are we playing? We are playing games made by other people. Yes, Indians are also making games, but how many games are being made? And even in the other people who they are making games, how is India being debited? And we have talked in depth about, you know, uh, games and their problematic representation, especially in terms of India. And I've given you examples, of course. So that is there. And now I will talk very briefly about patching cultures, about localizing games. And I will just show you a few examples and then I'll just move on because I've been, I just realized I've been talking for a bloody long time. I will just share my entire tab, entire window. Okay, so let's look at uh, this particular game called Cricket 7. Uh, 
Uh, let's see, Cricket 7 IPL 2022 patch. Now, if you see, this game is called Cricket 7. All right. Cricket 7 is a game that came out in the year 2006. It came out in 2006. Have there been no more cricket games since then? Yes, there have been this game called Cricket 2K. This this one called Cricket 22 comes out from the 2K industry. But it's only limited for playing in the PlayStation. And you need a controller to play it. You can't play it without a controller. But these you can play in your own, you just using the PC as well. It came out 2000, is still being patched. It's remarkable. What do I mean by this? What is patching, first of all? Patching is a game is there, and let's say a game that was created in 2020 would not have the updated team sheets from 2020. It's a game which is a sports game, right? Which has India in it. So 2000, if a game came out in 2001, then it wouldn't have Dhoni in the team, right? If a game came out in 2010, it wouldn't have Shubman Gill in the team, right? But what would you do if you want to play a game that came out in 2010, and you also want to have in it. What do you do then? That's when you start patching. That's when that you create another layer on top of that game with the new team, with the new graphics, and you put that layer on top of that existing layer. Cool. Now imagine popular and how flexible a game has to be in order for it to have been patched across generations and generations and generations. So much so that it is still being now that something is important to know that if and there is enough in a certain thing People will go to the basically their own, which is two decades old now. Hence, the participatory culture here is something very important to consider. Why are why are they still so popular? And why are new versions not created? This is something that I leave you to think about because, of course, I can't go this right now. There are other examples of this as well. Show you now, Vice City GTA Grand Theft Auto has a game called Vice City. Now, when we were growing up, Vice City had a very famous Bengali version called GTA Vice. And they actually had people speaking and cussing in Bangla. Absolutely mind, just mind boggling for people like us when we were kids. Right? It's absolutely unbelievable to think that it was even possible to have that thing going on. So it's the patching and exists not just in terms of um, updating and realizing. Because you're seeing that, that there is GTA Vice City Bangla, there is also Punjab. There is also GTA Punjab, as you can see, that with Torban and everything. Not this one, just give me a moment. 
platform. See, people have made like picks and stuff based on it. Like, like GTA Vice City Punjab. Now, these were not actual games created by Rockstar. These were people who came and modded these versions. So, in the absence of your own culture being depicted and represented, important to understand how people would go to the extent of creating their own cultures within these game spaces. As far as game is concerned, I would refer to this particular uh, piece. This is a course that I can learn. Just give me one moment. I have found now there is this particular from Abertree University, which is called Video Game Design and Development, Video Game Character Design, and I'll just show it to you. This is dot com you can find it very easily future learn and this is a free course free online course available on video game design and development on video game character and i started this course but i wasn't able to finish it that's why honestly speaking i don't have the expertise to talk about video game design but i can this course is very so if you just want the basics of video game design Please explore this course. And, and last but not the least, in order to finish our discussion on video games, let's representation of video game culture. And I'll just give two examples. One of them I've already talked in class. Number one, Andrew Snatch. So Andrew Snatch, interesting an example because Bandersnatch talks about gaming while being a game in itself or an interactive narrative in itself because it has multiple endings and stuff, right? And it features a game designer. So that is Bandersnatch, which talks about a game who falls into some kind of a problem. Now, another that there is Matrix, the, the new matrix four matrix resurrections so has the element of the game designer being trapped into the matrix and is forced to create a new game number two number three uh, this film free guy this is a Brilliant satire on games. Please watch it. Please watch this film. I love this film. This Ryan Reynolds, once again, developer gets stuck in developing a game and then things start going haywire. I would say that this is this should be a mandatory watch for anyone who's interested in games. Now, as you see, that there is a the game developer develops a game, gets stuck, and then something else happens. So that is one type of depiction. The other type of depiction is, of course, how game, how depiction of female gamer fetish. Yeah. See, there is something called the female gamer girl porn. If you are aware of what I mean, then, then you will absolutely understand that in pornographic cultures, you will see that there are many instances of how the gamer girl is depicted object to have sex with. And object of fetish because the act of gaming is seen like something that only the male body engages in. 
and engages in when the female body is seen to be engaging in the act then the idea is for that body to be treated as a passive object to be consumed literally and here you can see that getting girls to play games easy we paid this model 200 dollars an hour to pretend to play with us so it is the male fantasy which is projected the idea of the gamer girl which is very important to understand how the act of gaming is depicted in popular culture right we leave you with these few bread scrambles strewn across now find your areas of interest explore and just go crazy of course there are accessibility where of course there is this idea of the get good argument in games as well where there are some games which have been criticized for being too difficult so that people with disability the game so and there have been debates around this as well where people have been saying that don't play the game go and play some other game and there have been people who are saying that you know there should be mode so can a game design accommodate different levels of difficulty is it possible for that in terms of disability within games is that can that be given a thought at all now questions that i believe it's a personal question more than anything else it is at the end of the day a personal question so i with these persons with these provocation ideas you to ponder for you to think and for you to explore and for you to go crazy with i wish you all the very best especially for the people for whom this will probably be the last class in iit jodhpur i don't know if it is a fortune or a misfortune that you get to do that with me so yeah bye see you all the best take care